Hey, book lovers. My name is Em, and I want to talk about books. And cats. Hey, book lovers. So this past weekend, we did a holiday sort of Christmas Thanksgiving mix with my in-laws, and it was so nice. It was just perfect. And they got me like a bag of small gifts, which is honestly like my favorite type of gift. And almost everything had something to do with being cozy, and I just loved it. There was a really warm, soft um, shawl, scarf. It was like a little smaller than a pashmina. Um, I love it anyway. (laughs) They got me the absolute perfect winter hat, like the hat that I have been wanting that I definitely didn't tell anybody about, and some super cozy slipper socks, which are like my favorite thing. I'm so psyched. So needless to say, I didn't get a ton of reading done. (laughs) I also just had a week of just being real low energy, um, oversleeping. I don't know what was up. So anyway, I haven't finished the book that I'm working on reading right now. So I had kind of decided that this episode would be much more like cat based since I haven't talked about cat things in a while. But then I saw some mention of Edgar Allan Poe, and it clicked in my brain that I think one of his stories had a cat in it. Pretty sure Poe had cats in some of his stuff. So I start looking through his short stories, and lo and behold, The Black Cat, which was published in 1845. So I read this instead for this week, and it was great. I forgot uh, how much I enjoyed this story. It definitely took me a minute to adjust to Poe's language. I really love that older English. I was completely obsessed with it in high school, but it has been a minute since I was absorbed in that kind of writing. Anyway, I got into it, and the story's fantastic. The narrator is a man who is kind of recounting his life and how everything went to hell, (laughs) basically. He starts out being happily and newly married. They have a bunch of pets, including a large black cat named Pluto, who just adores the narrator. As time goes on, the narrator begins to get worse. He's an alcoholic, and he starts to become violent during this time. He abuses his wife and the other animals, but he tries to leave Pluto alone Eventually, though, he also attacks the cat, and in a rage, he ends up strangling the cat and gouging out one of his eyes. What the heck, man? (laughs) Pluto survives, though now he only has one eye, and obviously he flees at the very sight of the narrator. And he is still just having these fits where he feels like, you know, taken over by some other thing. Yeah, it's called alcoholism. Uh, anyway, he ends up hanging the cat one night, um, which is so freaking messed up, like just disturbing. But so he hangs the cat, buries it, cat's gone. Uh, he is at the store and there's this like random stray cat loving up on him and he's like, okay, I'll... I'll bring you home. And he's all black, except he has a white, he has a a few white furs on his chest. Um, And he also missing an eye. (laughs) So he brings this cat home. The wife loves this cat and becomes even more bonded with this one. But he, even though he initially really wanted it, he starts to despise the cat almost as soon as he brings it home. 
As the cat gets larger, the white patch on his chest begins to take a shape, and the shape is of the gallows. And so this is also making this man kind of paranoid. And so at one point, they are in the basement. They're working on something, and the cat's driving him nuts. He's drunk again, obviously. And in a rage, he goes to swing the shovel that he's holding down on the cat, and his wife stops him. And then he blacks out and kills his wife. The cat has completely disappeared. Obviously, it ran away. So now he's stuck with this problem of uh, he can't really take his wife out of the house because someone will see. Like, he's trying to figure out what to do with the body. And he realizes that the basement walls are flimsy, and there's a spot where there used to be a chimney that kind of juts out into the room. So he knocks down part of it, puts her body in there, bricks it back up, makes it look like nothing ever happened. He's very proud of himself. He's very proud of his work. Cannot find the cat anywhere. Days go by, no cat, and he's kind of digging it. It is nowhere in the house, as far as he can tell. So there is an investigation into his missing wife. He has to take the police through the house and On one of the trips, they demand to go into the basement. He takes them down there, and they look around. Everything's fine. And in a moment of bravado, he taps a cane against the part of the wall where he has entombed his wife's body. The police are, like, on their way out when he does this. And then suddenly, from the other side of the wall, there is a horrible yowl. And then they are tearing into the wall. They discover her. The cat was back there. And now he is going to the gallows. I really enjoyed this story. You can see where bits and pieces of other Poe stories are kind of in this one. I love that the cat gets him in the end. I find it frustrating that he's like blaming the cat for all of these things that are just his alcoholism, but I think that's kind of the point. It was a good story. Honestly, I would highly recommend all of Poe's stories. They're pretty excellent. Um, This one was great. (laughs) They usually have some kind of moral, too, so, you know, creepy but serves a purpose. (laughs) Anyway, it is time for a break, and when we come back, I'm going to talk about how cats have been depicted throughout the world. And then there will be another chapter of Heart of the Storm. Be right back. Welcome back, book lovers. So, cats abound in modern culture, but ancient cultures have revered them as well, and I thought we could briefly talk about how different cultures depicted cats. It was thought originally that cats were domesticated because they hunted mice that would eat the stored grains, but a recent study has found that cats actually domesticated themselves, which seems about right. (laughs) They were never specifically sought out for domestication, like dogs, but their coexistence with humans just kind of naturally developed uh, from a mutually beneficial relationship. So... Cats kind of decided that we were useful, we thought they were useful, it all works out. Seems right. (laughs) Modern cats actually stem from two major lines of lineage, starting at about 4500 BC. According to a recent study, they came from both Europe and Southeast Asia. But then they spread all over the world. (laughs) So in ancient Egypt, cats were known as the Mao, and played a large role in the society. They were associated with goddesses like Isis and and Bast. Cats were sacred animals, and killing a cat was absolutely forbidden. Whenever a household cat died, the entire family would mourn and shave their eyebrows, which I think I've briefly mentioned on here before. Families would take their dead cats to a sacred city 
where they would be embalmed and buried in a sacred repository, which is kind of wild. So there was just a whole place where cats were buried. Wild. Anyway, uh, Europe. So in Europe, there are various depictions of cats, obviously. The Kingdom of Cat was a legendary Pictish kingdom during the early Middle Ages, and there even used to be a county, which I think is now Shetland, called Inse Cat, meaning Island of the Cat People. In Norse mythology, the goddess Freya is associated with cats. Farmers sought protection for their crops by leaving pans of milk in the fields for Freya's special companions, which were two gray cats who fought with her and also pulled her chariot. They must have been pretty strong. (laughs) Of course, there are also the negative connotations of cats. Uh, There's folklore saying that they will suffocate a baby. Uh, Black cats are just generally held to be unlucky. I also found it interesting that cats were seen as good luck charms by actors and often helped cure an actor's stage fright, which kind of makes sense because cats are pretty calming. (laughs) Anyway, in ancient Greece and Rome, house cats seem to have been pretty rare. They actually used weasels more commonly as pets, and weasels were seen as the ideal rodent killers. So because of that, cats are rarely mentioned in ancient Greek literature, but there is a remark in Aristotle's History of Animals that female cats are naturally lecherous, which I found funny. So another thing I found interesting is that in Russia, unlike with Western countries, cats have been considered good luck for centuries. Owning a cat and especially letting one into a new house before the humans move in is said to bring good fortune. According to Russian law, there is a huge fine imposed for killing a cat. Uh, It was the same as for a horse or an ox. So I thought that was kind of impressive that Russia is so (laughs) pro-kitty. In China, the cats were favored as pets. They had long-haired cats that were specifically for catching rats, and then they had cats with yellow and white fur that were called lion cats, who were valued simply as cute pets. The cats could be pampered with items brought from the market, such as cat nests, and were often fed fish that were advertised in the market specifically for cats. So cats are almost treated more like people. (laughs) Which, yeah, that makes sense too. (laughs) Japan's all about cats. Uh, They are often depicted as supernatural entities. And there's also the figurine of the uh, beckoning cat, which is said to bring good luck to the owner. That is from a legend in Japan that a cat waved his paw at a Japanese landlord who was intrigued by the gesture and went towards it. A few seconds later, a lightning bolt struck where the landlord had been previously standing. And so he attributed his good fortune to the cat's fortuitous action. And it's been a symbol of good luck ever since. Anyway, there are a few other random cat depictions throughout history that I thought were worth a mention. There's a legend that states when Jesus Christ was born, he would not stop crying no matter what anyone did. And what finally calmed him down was a tabby cat. It jumped into the manger and its purring lulled him to sleep. It is said the Virgin Mary petted the cat in gratitude and the M on the forehead of the tabby cat is for her name. The one I found the most interesting was that There is something called the cat duet. Duetto buffo di dugati, I think. It is a popular performance piece for two sopranos whose lyrics consist entirely of just the repeated word meow. I found this fascinating. I wanted to know why this was written, but I really couldn't find much. This has been attributed to Rossini, but unfortunately he actually didn't write the cat duet. It first appeared in a collection of songs that was published in 1825 that used music from Rossini's 1816 opera Otello. The book was then put together by Robert Lucas Purcell, uh, who was himself a self-taught composer of songs and instrumental music. And in the collection, the cat duet is attributed to someone called G. Berthold, which is almost certainly a pseudonym for Purcell himself. 
I love that someone took the time to compose something that is just meows. Like, what a good sense of humor. That's old school sense of humor right there. (laughs) Oh, and now it's time for the quote of the week. And this time I have two. And I feel like this kind of covers the duality of cats. The first one is from Edgar Allan Poe. And the quote is, I wish I could write as mysterious as a cat. And I love that. Cats are very mysterious. You never know what's going on. They seem otherworldly. Yeah, they're mystical. And then the second quote I have is from the comedian Paula Poundstone. The problem with cats is that they get the same exact look when they see a moth or an axe murderer. And so I thought that summed up cats pretty well. <laughs> Let me know what you think. And now it's time for a new chapter of Heart of the Storm, straight from my brain to you, unedited. We're continuing this story until we get to the end. We're getting there. <laughs> We are on chapter 33 this week. Enjoy. Kevo was floating on an underwater current. His head was cradled in a large leaf, and a spray of bubbles supported his body. His hands floated out at his sides and rippled with the current. He felt something brush his hand, delicate fingers interlaced with his large, clumsy paws, and the pretty girl floating beside him smiled. Her long, blonde hair flowed out behind her. Her pale green skin glittered in the bright, sparkly light around them. She wasn't Nim, but they looked similar. This girl was even more beautiful, and Kevo was happy that the rush of water around them was too loud for talking. Just looking at her made him feel tongue-tied and nervous. The blue lights danced around them as they moved along the current. Kevo smiled closed his eyes, and tried to relax. He felt the girl squeeze his hand. Her nails dug into the flesh of his. Her nails dug into his flesh. It became uncomfortable, and he tried to pull his hand away. She held on, and the pain grew worse. Her nails seemed to grow as she held on. He wrenched his eyes open, and trails of bright red blood flowed from the cuts on his hand. When he turned his eyes to her face, she was smiling serenely. Then she squeezed harder. Lazal and Nim stood on the shore of the river. They stood shoulder to shoulder, not speaking, and staring into the swift-moving current. I don't like this, Lazal said after a long moment. Nim sighed and rolled her eyes. So you've said. This was part of the deal. Talk to Maz if you want to complain. He wasn't one of us. He'd just be in the way. Nazalt pressed his lips together and didn't reply. The water churned at their feet. The bubbles took on a pinkish hue. He turned away. Nim splashed him and laughed as he stumbled and fell onto the stones. He scrambled backward and tore his hand open on a sharp rock. Nim laughed. Take it easy, cousin. Everything is going according to plan. Lazal got to his feet and wiped his bleeding palm on his shirt. I didn't expect to like him. Nim wrapped a strand of her long, wavy hair around her thin finger. Her nails were pointed and filed sharp. They were polished dark blue and shimmery. He was cute. Not really my type, though. Lazal glared at her. We could have left him alone. Nim laughed and shook her head. The sound was musical. She walked along the river's edge for a bit, never turning to see if Lazalt followed. She knew he did. She climbed the steep embankment. The grass was soft and cool beneath her bare feet. Nim skipped happily. She had never felt so light. It had finally begun. She'd been waiting for so long. Lazalt trudged along behind her. He had a bad feeling. It was not just his betrayal of Kevo. Something was wrong. He had never liked Maz. They were always scheming, always looking for an angle. Maz never helped without making sure they got something in return. Lazalt felt uneasy whenever they were around. It was the same feeling he had now. Nim knew Lazalt was upset, but she didn't have time for emotions right now. She was sorry about his friend, but 
He was a commoner and of no use to them. He was an unnecessary loose end. Better he stayed in the endless river. Cerise would keep him company. Her sister was much more charming than Nim. She had endless patience and good cheer. Kevo probably wouldn't even notice he was trapped. Nim skipped across the open field, and the sound of the river was faint now. When she turned, it was hidden from view, and it made her heart skip a beat to be so far from the water. She felt giddy and lightheaded in the bright sunlight. Lizalt was glaring at her. He was a dark cloud over her excitement, but she didn't pay him much attention. He'd been her protector for years. Maz had introduced them on her 13th birthday. Lizalt was a gift as well as a project. He was charged with keeping her safe, and she was told to watch him, keep him busy, distracted. It had worked until now. Kevo had been the turning point. Some things could not be covered up and erased. She could use Cerise's help right now. Lizalt had been in love with her sister for years. Nim was the child of a different man. Her mother had pretended otherwise, but Maz told her the truth. Maz told her everything. They had come to the river realm after her mother died. Maz taught her the lore of the valley, the family history, their magical bloodline, the reign of her people, the river people, over the rest. Maz had promised Nim to return her family's power. When this was all over, they would rule together, air, land, and water. They would control it all. Okay she said, turning back to Lizalt. You have to carry me from here. It'll go faster. Like we practiced, okay? He nodded grimly. Nim felt a wave of irritation. She didn't like this new, stoic Lizalt. He was absolutely no fun. What good was taking over the valley if they couldn't enjoy it? Lizalt scooped her up and took off. He flew fast and erratically. Nim clung to him and kept her eyes squeezed shut. They had taken several practice flights, but she would never get used to being so far above the ground. He made short work of the flight. Nim forced her eyes open when she heard the grinding. The entire mountaintop was opening up to her like a giant, gaping maw. Ready? Lazalt shouted over the noise. In addition to the grinding stone, the air was now filled with the flapping of hundreds of wings. Nim bit her lip and nodded. She squeezed her eyes shut. Then Lazalt let go. Her long, pale gold hair fluttered above her like a flag as she fell. The wind roared around her and the world plunged into darkness as she entered the top of the mountain. Small hands grabbed at her. They pinched her skin and pulled her hair, giggling the whole time. But they did slow her fall. Finally, she rested amongst them held aloft by dozens of hands and fluttering wings. They lowered her gently. Nim was thrilled to feel her feet touch solid ground. The sea of giggling cherubs parted to let her pass. In the center of the great room stood a tall figure cloaked in yellows and golds. Nim walked confidently, but inside she was trembling with fear. The figure turned and Nim's step faltered just a little. Rhea's skin was a reddish gold and glittered with her languid, graceful movements. Her honey-brown eyes found Nim's, and a slow smile spread across her face. Nim forced herself to continue moving toward her cousin. Maz's true child was immensely powerful and incredibly cruel. A side only Nim saw. To Maz and all the others, Rhea was a calm, even-tempered enchantress. Maz had big plans for her. Nim and Rhea had known each other since childhood. Her mother had been wiped out with most of the river dwellers, and Maz brought the remaining few to a safe place inside the mountains. Maz chose Nim to be her daughter's friend, and Nim was unable to refuse. She owed Maz her life. Rhea knew this, and right from the start she became Nim's tormentor. Her smile made Nim's knees shake, but she forced herself to move forward and embrace Rhea. She forced her lips into a smile and tried to steady her heartbeat. 
Hello, Nim, Rhea said with a bit of a sneer. She always said her name like that, contempt just dripping from her words. Nim could feel the others turning against her. The little ones were mindless drones, tiny fragments of Rhea cloned from her very cells. Their hatred for Nim was buried deep in their DNA. You've got no friends here, cousin, Rhea continued. Moss called for me, Nim said softly. It's time. Rhea smiled even wider. You are right about one thing. It is time. But Maz did not call you. They're on their way to the palace right now. I called you. And you came. Just like you always do. Nim could feel the little ones around her becoming agitated. Rhea took a step toward Nim and her minions moved in closer. Come with me. We will speak in private. She waved her hand and the fly bits backed off. They still hovered nearby, giggling, but also eyeing Nim warily. Something wasn't right. The whole atmosphere had changed. Nim didn't move immediately, and she felt little hands shove her from behind. She fell forward and Rhea caught her. Steam seeped from under her fingers, and Nim's skin grew painfully hot under her cousin's touch. She released Nim so quickly she almost fell again, but this time she stayed on her feet and stumbled after her sparkling cousin. The hallway was a narrow passage carved in the stone of the mountain. The ceiling was low, and Nim felt ill the deeper they went. Claustrophobia was closing in, and she wanted to turn and run back to the wide, open cavern full of fly bits. She turned and looked over her shoulder. The faint light at the end of the corridor was mostly blocked by small, hovering bodies. Their eyes glowed in the darkness, and Nim could feel the malice in their stares. Suddenly, the confined, narrow space seemed like the preferable option. She quickened her pace until she caught up with Rhea. They turned a sudden corner, and the new hall was slightly more open and lit with floating balls of fire. Rhea moved her hand and made them dance. Nim was transfixed. How did you do that? She hadn't meant to ask. Nim had seen plenty of magic in her life, but fire magic was something wholly new to her. She found it both thrilling and terrifying. Rhea smiled. Nim wasn't sure because of the swirling lights, but her cousin's smile seemed warmer than before. But then it faded. I have something to tell you, Nim. It will explain why I have been so cruel to you. I regret it, and I would like to apologize for the pain I have caused you. Nim didn't know what to say. The apology was so unexpected and so out of character that she froze, waiting for the trick. I, uh, yeah, I forgive you. Rhea's eyes were sad. Wait, she said softly. You may change your mind. She gestured to a wall and a panel of stone faded away. She motioned for Nim to step through. Quick, in here. Then I'll tell you everything. Nim stepped through, and Rhea quickly followed. The stone reappeared, and they were plunged into darkness. And that is the end of chapter 33, book lovers. I hope you're still enjoying Heart of the Storm, and I am so glad to be back. Tell me what your favorite cat story is, if you have one or what your favorite Edgar Allan Poe story is, because he's got so many good ones. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, keep reading.